So here is, here is the Buckingham Palace in some detail that you will probably... Uh, hmm? that you'll probably not see uh, in any Google image. We have, we have had a, a laser scan conducted. We had a LiDAR scan made to, for the building. And that was up to, I think, about three millimeters exact at the time of the scan being taken. And then the uh, company that provided us with the CAD model that resulted out of that uh, had reworked us, uh, had reworked the whole the whole thing back to us uh, in in boxes that were that were constituting this model that you see here and the reason I'm giving you this slightly uh, slightly awkward shading is that I would like to highlight everyone to the way that we got delivered the the scan to our um, to our office it's basically an amalgamation of lots of blocks that were that were visible to AutoCAD and to, uh, to create the, the building in, in all its detail from, from the scanned lines. But the averaging, the averaging techniques that are used here then create lots of intersecting uh, boxes for each ledge, for each, for each bit you can see on this, uh, on this building. So therefore, if you, if you rendered it from glass or like, like this here, then that obviously means that there's lots of faces, lots of detail that isn't really required. And that we don't want inside our media server in particular at the time of the show because it will just overload. So what we were doing is, here's another detailed view of this. There is, as you can see, there is some intersecting line. I don't know, can you see my cursor here? Yes, you can. Um, so the, the intersecting blocks make it very hard for us to work with this because what we need to do, and we'll, we'll cover that in a little bit, especially inside D3, we need a, a unified UV map of the whole building. So therefore, what we're aiming for is to rebuild the whole, the whole building into one big hull. Now, here's a before and there's an after. Although it looks more complicated, this is actually a lot cleaner for us because we have now got everything sorted out as one major hull. And here you can see the impact that has for us. We went from just over 135,000 vertices to uh, 87,000 points. And to us, that also means a huge reduction in the actual space that, or the surface that our model takes inside our uh, media server. So because we remodeled the whole, the whole building, we also were able to assign different, different uh, shaders and, all, and, and put our focus onto lots of different parts that we had to cater for in the final animation to this, build, to this building. So um, while we were doing the simplification of the model, we also uh, created these content maps. So on the one hand, we had a model that that had this content map at the, at the top with all, all the colors uh, for us that allows us to create masks for all sorts of things later on in the process. And we'll see that this is really important in this particular case. And the bottom mask, which is literally an outline rendering, is really, really helpful for when we come to the actual on-site install of this, uh, of this project. Right, so we did, we did have a content template. Here's another image of, that I find particularly beautiful for, for what we achieved on the building, after all. Um, just, to, just to get back to the requirements on, on the show, the 240 lumen is actually um, was, was a, a challenge in itself because prior, prior uh, projection mapping jobs had probably 120 lumens if you think about uh, Milbank or other, other things like that. Um, but 240 to cater for the needs that, uh, that the BBC had on this particular one was actually quite a lot. So Steve Greetham from Excel Video suggested that we would actually take six projectors that look at the same thing all the time. So in, in essence, we had six different clusters 
for, of, of projectors and one cluster looked like this. We basically worked out one cluster would have one master projector that we would then home all the other projectors to. So this is the real big challenge for the projectionists in this case that we had that we had five projectors that wouldn't sit on the on the master one at this point. So the overall spider chart for the wire diagram for this job looked like this. I basically sat down with Excel, with Sam, with D3 Technologies, and we together decided that this was the right wire diagram for this job. We had two matrices uh, serving, serving the job. We were running a hot backup, so we were running all of our projectors at any one time, but we catered for them through two different systems, if you want to say so, because that allowed us for, if there was matrix failures, if there was any failures in anything downstream from the matrices, we could then still have a show, but less bright. Um, so, whereas everything from about the splitter level here, was actually a uh, hardware installed by Excel Video, just under uh, and in close, in close relation with everybody from uh, D3 Technologies and myself on site. Um, the, the, the lower end of this is actually currently showing four D3s, and in my, in my drawing I had three D3s there. Um, I'm gonna cover that in a second. We had four machines on site because we were actually in, we had to line up something as complicated as this. So let me jump back one second. Here we are with the spider chart, and I want to show you how that spider chart relates to the, real, to the real thing, to the real scenario. So we are actually inside D3 right now. I figured out this morning that I can do keynotes from within here. And here you are with Buckingham Palace, and in blue at the bottom, we can actually see how, how we distributed our signal to the two sites and uh, um, the, the special requirements here were, it, it was actually quite tricky because this area is obviously uh, very sensitive. It's probably one of the most uh, secure places in Britain. We all had to go through like lots of security checks and so on, but the guards at, at, the, at the gate were actually quite, quite nice guys. Um, at the front of the of the exercise ground here there is a shaft in the ground that's probably um, the the diameter of two rain pipes and all the cabling was put into place days before we got to site so we in our in our technical meetings we had like lots of HDSDI cables that would then distribute to boxes uh, next to the projectors and everything came together to our HQ that was here. So obviously, from Projection HQ, we did not have line of sight to the building. And our projectionists all did, a, did an amazing job, but they took their tablets and would then sit next to their projector towers and do the lineup of one projector to the other um, with, with their, their usual uh, professionality, but we had to, because this is, um, because we are in this D, uh, D3 model that's, that's actually a three-dimensional representation, we had to match our image to the building as well. So let me show you how we, how we firstly distributed the signal to, to the projectors. We would do one projector at the time, and we would basically stagger our, our approach. We would go from projector, I'll show this again. We'll go from projector one, to projector three, to two, to four, to six, to five. And the reason we needed to do that is, let me show you this again. This image actually tells you a lot more that now that you know how we catered for, for this. We did one projector on the outside, and then we could actually see where our lines would trace on the building. We then, then did that two projectors further on and then would say, okay, this is the reasonable margin of error that, we are get, that we're getting right now on the building. Now, if we put the projector inside, in the middle, in between, then all we need to do is tweak it to one of the edges. So that was the theory. 
it worked out quite well, but what you're seeing here is actually a lineup pattern for the projectionists. So what we wanted to do was actually to get these projectors here to look at the building exactly in those, in those perspectives. And now we're getting back to why it's so important to have that laser scan and such an accurate model. This model here is now virtually being seen by those projectors. This is not just a representation. I'll show you something here. All these projectors are actually looking at the building right now. So this is what this first projector, the red one, is actually seeing. So let's do something. Let's break this. Okay. So if I go in here, you can now see what will happen if I take this projector and I put it somewhere else in space. This is real-time images. So we are capable of recalculating our look at positions for our projectors based on where they have been rigged. So that means that we don't have to give the projectionists a flat image. We can actually give them a representation of what the projector should really be seeing if it was to look straight at the building. So, yeah, I've, I've broken it a little bit. No, I came back to a good point. So, the approach that we are taking with this is that each of these projectors, and let's just look, let's focus on on this red one here right at the beginning of that line of projectors. We're looking for vertex points, so points on our original scan that we can see with reasonable precision at the night, even just putting one projector onto the building. So here you can see a number of points that we would say we would like to register this image to. And we would distribute a whole number of points across this whole building and have our projectors then calibrate to those points. So this process is called auto-calibration inside D3. Before we got to site, we put the projectors roughly in the places where Excel Video told us they would put them. And then we basically got a pretty much millimeter exact measurement from aligning our our calibration points to the real deal. So we would say we would like to see oops. We would like to see, for instance, the the point here on the apex of, of that architectural feature. And we would then go in and we would have a spotter outside right in front of the building, really close to it, who would then look at whether this point was actually at the right spot. And the way we're doing that is, I'll show you very quickly, we'll actually find a point, oops, that was quick. We'll find a point we'll find a point like one of those red uh, doubles here where the crosshair represents the actual point where we put our reference points in the, 3D, in the 3D model, still inside this, this program. And we would then tweak the little, the little dot to the correct point in space, where we would actually see this on the building. So we, we can then calculate out of the error that we have all, all over the building, we can calculate the exact point that this master projector is set at. So, let's end this. If I can end it. And have a quick look at what that really looked like. Oops. Just bear with me. OK. 
there you go. So here we now have the template, the outline render, being matched to the building. And this is actually not our final lineup. This was in the night before the final lineup. So we had the, the grid lines on the building. We matched the grid lines. This is not content. This was just the, the, the render that I've just shown you earlier on as the template file. So we could make sure that what we distributed as this sort of colorful and outline content template to our 2D and 3D teams that Sam uh, asked to create their amazing content to, that that would perfectly sit on the building the way that we had promised those creators and the client, of course. So what we are able to see is that the simplification that we had in our model, say, for instance, here at the bottom where we didn't have all the details in there, was, was actually catered for really beautifully. And now I would just like to show you another, another thing that was really tricky install, you will realize that the projector cones that I have in my model here are actually very narrow. They hardly have any overlap. So the, the, usual, the usual job and talking to the projectionist just before, before we get going with a production like this would be that we require quite a big overlap to then do the, 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 the edge blending. But in this case, we could, only, we could only get these 36 projectors and it so turned out that their overlap would be minimal as, uh, as minimal as probably less than 20 centimeters at the time. So let me show you a visualization of this. If we take D3, we can actually look at what a projector will throw onto the building prior to actually doing it. We have this test pattern here, and we can simulate the cone throw onto the building. We can actually also see where these will overlap with the rest. So it's a really helpful tool, not just to pre-visualize our show on this, which I'll show you later on, but to actually plan out for the projectionists what type of lenses do we think are good, what how many projectors will we be able to serve for, and what implications will that have on the distortion of that? Right. So here and there are two images that I find personally not only beautiful, but really, really important. This is the same spot that I just showed you here. So this seam here and that seam over there are in fact the one here next to that column and over there. And that was all the overlap we had. So with that in mind, what we did first was to register our projectors. And now I'm going to come back to the, this, this grid I showed you earlier. Oops, the next one, this one. In this grid, you can actually see how there's only one projector left and one projector right, but there's already one overlay on the central images. So here, the projectionists would then be able to match their projectors with an internal grid to each other. So they didn't have to get a signal from us once we had done our lineup pattern. Once we were, f we, once we were happy with the actual lineup of our three-dimensional image, they could work out to any arbitrary, arbitrary map that they would shoot through the projectors. So again, here was in a little bit more detail. So on average, we would get that amount of overlap for the whole building. And because any, any kind of mapping that we do with, it, with D3 would then inevitably be mapped or edge blended with 8-bit gradients, that wasn't enough for that, for that amount of pixels. Because if we go back to the conclusion we had earlier on of about two and a Oh, okay. 
of about just over two centimeters, or just under three centimeter pixels, then we only have about 16 or, or just a little bit more pixels to do an edge blend. So that would have been that would have been virtually impossible to do with digital means. So the real the real challenge to the to the Excel projectionists here was to use French. So over 36 projectors on Buckingham Palace. Once we had done the, the overall calibration, they were all French flagged. And I, I must say that I think this is an amazing achievement for the time that we had. We did the whole install in three nights and um, I, I think um, they, they did a brilliant job there. And this is another reason why we actually staggered our approach, just to come back to this, because then we could see how our template would fit between two or three projectors while the projectionists could work on the other side of the building or one of the intersected projector sets to then do the best of their work right then. So because we had this colored template and we had done all the work in reworking the model, in coloring the three-dimensional model, in rendering different masks from that model, we're now coming to see something. This is the night before the show and we had a light rehearsal. You have a very bright frame on there. And this is, of course, the home of the royal family and they were at home. So that night before, before the show, one of the guards came back came to me and said, how long is this going to take? With his MP right there saying, like, Prince Edward wants to sleep. At that time, we, we knew that we had to do, that we had to do something uh, a little bit more quietly. But all along, we had worked with these masks. So once we had done our initial lineup, we were able to put masks around all the windows of the building to not shoot into any of the private rooms, let alone any of the other, other windows. So because we had this three-dimensional representation, it, was, it took literally two or three minutes to create a new mask to cater for, say, blinding lights in the eyes of the guards. Right. Do I have more images? No, I don't. I would like to show you how this looked in the pre-visualization just before the show. Because right now, what I've shown you so far is, let's just recap this, the, what we did to the laser scan, how long we had to, to deliver this project, how long it took us to install on site. But this doesn't give you an indication on how we actually worked to sequence to the tracks. I mean, it was an amazing, amazing uh, project to work on. And I'm so honored to, to have been working on some of the same things where Paul McCartney was singing. So, let, so it, it gives us the flexibility of matching something as complicated as Buckingham Palace. If we have prepared our model the right way. If we are, if we are ready with knowing where our points will be that we want to, that we would like to align to, and then we're just ready to receive content from our from our amazing team. So if that team has worked to the prerequisites that we have given them, such as working to the right frame rate and going really bright and amazing to their to their uh, to their track, then at this point. We are giving, we're handing our D3 project over to the guys that will actually operate it on the night. In this case, Chris Bird and Luke Collins from D3 Technologies were sequencing the show in the studio together with Sam. And they were able to just take the whole show, the way they had sequenced the whole show with the latest audio, with the latest video, and bring it to us to site, plug it in, and then we would install just their timeline to our lineup. So that way we could tackle this project from two ends and get, get all this delivered in time. Um, I think right now I have to thank you for the opportunity, thank Plaza for the opportunity to let me speak about this. Um, I will be here today just over the course of this afternoon. If you want, I will answer more questions. I'm pretty uh, sure you will have lots of questions right now, and I think uh, I'll hand over to Sam in a second. But if you do have the need later on, see me at the D3 stand, as you can see there. Thank you. 
Sam Patterson, guys. I just wanted to add why we chose D3 as a system for this job. I've worked with D3 since 2004 on several jobs, U2, Vertigo and so on. And we've used it as just simple playback and also for interactive and other mapping jobs, which it performs well at both. Um, the, the main reason is the visualizer, which for this job in particular is essential. So it really means in a short timeline, we can start building the project and we can give the animators, some of whom have got no experience in mapping jobs, we can show them what it's going to look like and what it's going to do um, very accurately, very early on. As we build the project, we can go along um, and add to that in placeholders, and it's a very seamless process. Um, yeah, so with the, the, also with this job in particular, we wanted to use the, the uh, palace as a full-frame canvas, not just for mapping tricks. And again, D3 can do that. Uh, perfectly well. So that's really the um, the main reasons we chose it. If you've got any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. As will Nils. Yeah, just go, uh, while you are speaking, I'm just going through some more of the images here, and you can see some of the stuff that went on for Sir Elton. Then one of our animators did this this really nice light look that worked incredibly well. It's not 3D, it's, it's, it's a 2D approach to this, to this mapping, but he needed our content map nevertheless, and he worked to that, and it worked really, really well just to see those lines on, on yeah. the building. Uh, it's, it, this is also like all the, all the lessons that we are taking from this is to, to help animators along the way um, to... To, to basically go deep into into like be bold be be contrasty and and I think the visualizer actually really helps them to see that as as of course the the client to see that there is a show and can I add for those reasons D3 becomes part of the design process as opposed to just a control or playback system How did you deal with the focal length, with the projectors being placed vertically at the essentially the left axis of the canvas yeah. um, and the building being so high? I'm going to put you over to Nils. There wasn't a huge amount of difference in vocal, vocal length, but Nils can go into detail. Basically, all the projectors, any projector, has just one focal plane, of course. Now, in the usual way of... of lining up a projector you would probably use lens shift to cater for this but we really highly uh, advise our projectionists before like we, we try to work out a method statement with projectionists uh, and sit everybody on the table just before we try to not do that the reason is first of all although this is this is looking quite dramatic it's all still within a reasonable area of sharpness of the lens on the other hand, it's also that we were overlapping six projectors. We knew that we wouldn't get a perfectly sharp image at any one time. It's, um, it's, very, it's possible to get one pixel on top of the other, but you will always wash out your image ever so slightly. So what we did is, um, I personally have worked on a lot of mapping jobs, a lot of the, the mapping jobs in, in, uh, in London, before and uh, the experience showed that a lot of the detail on the building gets actually eaten up by the features that you are projecting onto. So you have to consider that the usual audience has a point of view that is low. So any, any feature in your building will actually create a sharp line anyway. And you, if you are a projectionist, uh, then you'll probably know that if you have a static image of text then you'll always see that the projector is not in focus or that there's something blurry going on but as soon as you put some contrasty video on then then perception actually really helps us along which is also the reason why we decided that 4k was enough for this building because you can you can clearly see that we could have accompanied uh, 6k onto this but again it was not useful to do it because it would have been very long render times in, in a three-week production. And on the other hand, 
uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to always go to the level of perception and work back from there, if that answers your question. Um, yeah. My next question then would be, how did you decide what height or what viewing height to render the content out at if you had seating stands behind the stage? Well, because the didn't that affect then the focal plane even more? Well, or the graphics plane? The, the, content the most important thing there really was this was built for television and we had the master camera behind the stage so we built everything to that. And there were people in the audience so we could get the illusion and people of the size have lost it. You, we can't satisfy everyone. That in mind, we designed a lot of the content not to be purely optical or just or uh, you know to create an illusion, but actual canvas. So it included all of the audience as opposed to excluded most of them. It is worthwhile saying, though, that this that this has implications on on other buildings very clearly, but remembering the images, the mall was filled with people. So also catering for the camera was actually catering for most of the audience as well. Uh, you mentioned in your uh, presentation can, regarding... Can you speak up, sorry. Oh, sorry. You mentioned in your presentation that you had a lot of content uh, creators that hadn't uh, video mapped before. Um, did they find uh, their experience with uh, D3 um, something that they could sort of get on with creation rather than then sort of have to deal with the technology of mapping. Yeah, so, um, what, sorry, can you make that into a question? Or? Sorry, the, the question is, uh, the experience of your creators, yeah. uh, the use of the D3 system, did that make their creation a lot easier? Uh, the, uh, yes, the yeah, for sure, because um, you do have a lot of creators that are very experienced in, say, 3D. You have a lot of uh, creators who are really experienced in 2D. But most creators are not experienced on working to that building. With building projection uh, and, and projection mapping, every surface, everything is a possible surface. But therefore, everything has its particular challenge. And I think, uh, I think Sam will be able to talk about this in more detail, but it actually allows us to, to give uh, the content guys, I mean, I'm a content creator myself as well, but um, it allows us to, to take different perspectives. We can see where an illusion starts breaking it, it, it allows us to inform more of, of the creative on the building already. And I think this is really, really important because I can, I can give everybody the reasonable assurance that, look, this is the template I made for you. Now I'm just putting this onto this model and this is exactly what we will be doing for you in the real world. So as long as you test it against this, you're fine. And I think that gives a lot of uh, liberation to, to that. And it basically means that you can make any content creator uh, confident in delivering. What would you say? Absolutely. It's an essential tool uh, for this job in particular because of the tight time frame and for people with that experience in mapping. The great thing about D3 for us is we could have the laptop in the studio and drop content in that and be very spontaneous with our testing and viewing. Also, we could render out movies, which we could send to animators that were doing work remotely. We had guys in Wales and the north of England, so they can be updated all the time. As well as sort of seeing what the application, the animation to the structure does visually, it's very helpful to give the animators a sense of scale and the size of the building, which is 108 by 28, I believe. So obviously the animation should only move so fast, you know, getting the pace right in terms of colour and, and, and um, contrast and so on. These are all things that um, we can address by using the visualiser. I'm just showing you this here. We can also just load some... We're doing everything to scale. We have an infinite stage and we're doing everything to scale. So we have these sprites with our dummy audiences, even though they would have not been in those positions because nobody was allowed right there. But we can, we can actually get a sense of scale also through that.
Yeah, you can see you can see it here. It was this is a very straightforward job. But this is not this is not in the in the actual in the actual sense a mapping job. If you consider that your content create in this case the content creator did not have to give us anything that was pre distorted for our projectors. So here we're just looking at the feeds and like I'll just have a quick look at how that looked for one of the other projectors and usually you would have to do some sort of pre-distortion to all the bits of content and here we were saying please just work to this rectilinear grid and you you can create something something very quickly and um, I find it personally very assuring that um, on a lot of jobs like this if the content template has been delivered right a lot of the 2d 2d content things that come from after effects for instance are very very effective in the end of the day I, i've been on a lot of on a lot of jobs of of this nature or on the on the projection nature where once that was understood well this created content that was really strong and stood out more questions please Um, this may sound like an obvious question, but was the content that was created um, by the generators or the, the animators 2D and traditional, and then D3 does all the remapping, or does D3 need to have all the content created of all the, you know, the, the alcoves and things built into it? In, in this particular case, um, what we did is we actually assumed a very, very, very flat point of view on this. So therefore, what we do with, with this model is we are baking in this view for our animators. So we are setting this view as a fixed thing just for the convenience of delivering within that, within that time frame. Now, what we could do is we could use different points of view and mix them. We could also, um, here, your your animator really only needs to work to what we give them as a template. What we could do is we could unwrap every column. We could unwrap every element of, uh, of say, the interior of, of some of these doors or the, um, the run rounds on, uh, on the architectural, uh, on the banisters here. Um, we, can all, we can do all this, but in that case, in this particular case, it wasn't necessary because the audience and the, the camera points of view were so far away. So here, what we did is we had a very flat uh, viewpoint and the animators didn't have to render anything sort of unfolded. But we can do that too, depending on the use of, of the application. So. Maybe if you come, come around this, uh, the, uh, the stand later on, you'll see a sculpture. And that sculpture has, has several different viewing angles. And there we're taking a slightly different approach where we're unfolding it all and then work our, work our uh, shadows and lights and all that just to that particular template. But also, within D3, what I showed you here earlier on, let me just jump back to this. When I was showing you this, we can, we can obviously take a camera, but we can also make a camera, a, 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 virtual, a virtual projector, which is essentially sampling that point of view. We can also make it the producer of that, of that particular content. So we can take something from that point of view, and we could say, from that point of this, of this camera, our audience of one, if you wish, would be the person standing right here. And we want to cater only for Her Royal Highness's needs in this particular spot. And we could do that. And we could do that almost to any content as well, without having pre-rendered it that way. I think there is there is some spare minutes on on the talk, so I'm, I'm more than happy to answer more questions. But if 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 that if that kind of if you don't have any more questions, then let's all grab a coffee.
Uh, <clears throat> yes. Um, the the actual playback of the video. Yep. Uh, is this embedded into D3 and played, or is this from separate sources being played in? Is it, is it one 4K file? Um, what you're seeing is a, a full-grown a full media server just in the timeline. Just the timeline here at the bottom is the media server. So we are currently playing back a 4K, 4K video onto this structure virtually, and we are then outputting this into bite-sized chunks that can go directly into the matrix. No, no further, this, this is the actual, this is where the, where the real magic happens. All the other stuff is pre-visualization, but in terms of event handling and cater or, or distributing signal, this is all happening here. If I had a breakout card, then I could actually now serve this, serve this out. Okay, sorry, uh, probably what I meant was, or Basically, here you're using you're using three servers. Each yep. has duplicate content that is kept in sync. Yep. What we but what each we is outputting a separate piece of that same video. Yes. Yeah. One server one server is handling four uh, projectors at any one time, and what we were doing is we were running one master machine that we can strip into here. We have a network manager, and in here. We, dis we assign roles to our machines. So if I were the master, so to say, I would then get a certain feed scene. And the master, in this case, would only be sitting there and telling everything else what to do. And then we would have one slave outputting three, three images here, and we would have another slave that was outputting the rest. And we were having the master also standing by, taking over for any of those roles. So we, we could basically have one machine idly just playing through, doing, doing, the, doing the sequencing and, uh, and controlling and making sure that this machine has very little load. And we would then just put the video processing through to others that, were, that could at any one time, should they be going unhealthy in their frame rate, be taken over before they crash. Down here, once, once you are in a network situation, we actually get an indication on how healthy every machine is. Okay. Hello. Uh, I have just one question here. That is a little bit about the practical stuff in this. Uh, the budget for this and how long time did you have to make this? Uh, the timing was... I, I don't know if you can answer any of the of the other questions. I can go on to the timing aspect. We were we were start Sam called me about three and a half weeks before the show. We then had a laser scan done, which took the awful amount of almost five days to get back to us. Then we had three days of reworking our model and UV mapping it and, and basically creating our templates. And then um, Sam briefing the team and myself then being on call for the team to answer their questions regarding the template. And then we had a machine similar to this at the office where everybody could basically drop their content and have a look at how their content would work. Then it was almost two weeks of, no, two and a half weeks, no, sorry, almost two weeks of production of the actual content while I was already vacating to site to then do the install parallel to that at the last couple of, yeah, last three days, nights actually. <laughs> Sorry. I can't say exactly how much things cost, but obviously the, the bulk of the cost was on projection and crew and power for the week that they were installed in the palace. In terms of systems and programming and the D3 end, it's very reasonable. Um, again, I can't say exactly, <laughs> so he's worth talking to. And content, you can spend as much or as little as you want, you know. Budgets were, budgets were not disclosed to me, so. <laughs> I think there was one other question. I saw somebody over there. Um, but the content 
presumably was created to um, some time code or to, to the tracks. So I was wondering, did the performers play strictly to a time code or was there some variation in that? How did you deal with matching the, the timeline of the content to the timeline of the performers actually uh, on the night? Um, there was only Madness and one other that played to time code. Um, and Madness was important because that was a, very much based on seeing that piece. The music was being, the audio was being played out by Spot On, which doesn't generate time code. So Chris Bird at D3 um, went and spoke to the BBC and they generated time code to trigger, which worked very well. In terms of the other pieces, for Elton particularly, he doesn't play to time code. When we did the karaoke for um, Crocodile Rock, that was a manual cue, which again is another aspect of D3 which we enjoy, that we can go from time code to just one, one manual cue to then several manual cues to build a song to follow the artist and the audio as it comes. I'm just showing you something. It's, it's very easy to create a MIDI device right here. I can create a MIDI device super quickly, but this MIDI device is actually an output of timecode. I, I, can, I can actually cater for either MTC coming in, MIDI notes. Um, it, all, it all works uh, quite, quite nicely. It's all very integrated. And the beauty of the server in this case is that MTC, should we be getting a slightly different signal, the whole video is slave to that. If we get MIDI notes or if we get MTC and somebody's changing anything on the clock or on the, uh, on, on the beat clock, then D3 will re-render the video to the exact frame rate that it needs to play back in order to fit into the coming up chorus or whatever it is. So it will actually ever so slightly stretch everything to fit. Sorry, I think your, your mic's off. Hello? Yeah. Based on the things you just said of being able to adjust things sort of in real time almost, yeah. I'm interested almost in a slightly macabre way of, did anything majorly go wrong? And if it did, how did you cope with it? The weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because you mentioned Elton John, and I doubt he played there. No. no he's, uh, I think the weather and the... Yeah. Well, I, the think, I think there is there's always... It would be, it would be very... Uh, very strange if something wasn't going to plan, but if that's going wrong, I don't know. So, in I told you earlier that we had a very tight schedule for install. So one of the things that didn't go wrong, but that was slightly um, that that basically didn't go to plan, was that some of our boxes, some of this amazing uh, heap of hardware that uh, came from Excel was not perfectly set back to its, uh, to its standard settings. So for half a night, we would only get through SD signals instead of HD SDI. And so we basically then had to uh, carry some reels of fiber channel over, over the forecourt to the amusement of the guards and then plug that in quickly and then have that sorted by the day shift and then come back the next afternoon. Now, because this is such a, such a quick and integrated process, we did lose a night and we had to have a debrief at the end of the night when it got uh, uh, the eastern side of the, of the palace already caught the first light. We then had to call it a night and say, okay, we'll sort this out. Some, some of the guys from, from uh, the warehouse will sort this. And when you come up ne uh, tomorrow night, we'll deal with it. And uh, it basically abbreviated our lineup time to only two and a quarter or so nights, but it worked. The other thing that could go majorly wrong is that you have a power failure. By the time we were on site, there was already problems with two of our three generators, but they got fixed while we were running off the other. And our system is, at the moment, we are trying to work out our systems and our wire charts so that we have a level of redundancy for all the outputs and we have a level of redundancy for all the um, all the network hubs everything that we need is infrastructure to run the show but the the reality of it is that if there's no show power then we are we keep playing and the projectors turn off 
So if something really went wrong, you would have seen it. Nothing went wrong, everything worked to plan, everything stayed healthy. We really didn't need our backup, um, but we still built it in. I think that we're starting to run, to run over the time that was assigned to us. Um, I don't want to be rude to the next speaker, so um, maybe one last question on, unless thank you for your attention and um, yeah, I hope to see you at the stand maybe. Thank you.